Bleh. <laughs> you know, by the way, it was about a year ago that we did our last one. I know. Isn't it funny? You were on my December episode last year. It's yeah. perfect, Jeff. You're my it is December per it's guy. It's perfect, man. I'm your December guy. I hear my dog yeah. barking, so give me one second. Go ahead. La 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 Mark's podcast, Mark's podcast. We are on Mark's podcast. This is his show. It's his favorite show. It's his show. It is his podcast show. I just did four and a half hours on Jingle All the Way yesterday. La 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 la. I hope Mark has headphones and can't hear me. I can totally hear you. Oh my God, that was awesome. That was uh, that was going to be a surprise for you later on. Like, oh, I love it. I could totally hear you. I love it. That'll be the uh, opening. I won't do my normal theme song. I'll do that. That's perfect. Yeah. All right. Right? How you guys doing up there in uh, Maine? In Maine. It's good. It's getting cold. I'm not going to lie. It is. I bet. I whew. bet. Yeah. Last year I was able to. Check, check, Maybe because it was like our first winter here. My first like full winter here. I got through it. I was okay with it. But. I don't know. Now yeah. that it's getting so chilly, oh, it's making me like irritable. So we get less gotta, tolerant of that as you get older. Yeah, I gotta like go to Florida, or I don't want to go to Florida, but I gotta go somewhere warm for like a week. You know. You know, I think that Arizona would be the perfect place yeah. in the world if it had like an ocean connected to oh, it. You know, you're, right? Yeah. Or like a nice big lake, or yeah, yeah totally. Well, there was the Salton Sea, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know if yeah. you want to go to the Salton Sea. Not a yeah, not right. a good place. Not I'll a good place. That. Okay, Jeff. So um, we're gonna do. Let's talk about Hook first. Okay, that'll be my episode this week, and then we'll just keep rolling and go right into Scream. Um, Great. And yeah, I'm thinking since you and I have been wanting to talk about Scream for a while, um, mm -hmm. we can definitely spend a little bit more time on that. All Great. right, everybody. He is back. Mr. Jeff Frummis. He was on the show exactly a year ago, last December. He talked about Edward Scissorhands and another Robin Williams film, Jumanji. He is on the show today. I'm so happy and thankful. Jeff, welcome back. Yo, 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 yo. I bet my audio sounds a lot creamier too because I'm using the uh, sound device. And last time I believe I used a headset, which was not a little oh, bit more yeah. tinny. But so Jeff, it's been a year since I last talked to you. Crazy. How was your 2021? Um, it was surprising, actually, because I, I just have really fallen deeply into the YouTube rabbit hole. I got my mm. account remonetized. Uh, That's right. Remember, you were talking about that last year. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it had good. just happened. So I've had my account monetized and I've had some some nice growth and Amazing. it's just a gr it's a it's a grind. And yeah. especially when you don't try and chase trends like I. I review popular movies, but I really only talk about like niche subjects that I'm very interested in. And that yeah. that's a lot slower growth. You know, if you talk about cryptocurrency or some nonsense like that, you're, you know, YouTube is going to push you up in the algorithm. But if you're yeah. talking about obscure horror movies, that's not oh, good for advertisers. So it's just like the best. But, you know, but that's yes, the best. Yeah. You're right. You're right. It's not great. However, at least that's your that's your niche. And right, that's my passion. That's my niche. That's what I can do. You're not jumping all around, you know, which could also be very hard for growth. You know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. when you're just talking about all sorts of topics, which sounds super great, well, I do, you know, people can't. I do rely do that as you. well. I I, yeah. I do do. I just said and, the but word it's do -do. working it, slowly a lot. But that's right. my point is that it's it's a lot slower. I because I talk about music stuff too. I yeah, talk about a, a, a few different things. And what YouTube wants you to do is it wants you to kind of do the same thing over and over and over again. That's yeah. bringing the success. So if I do right. something that's like a if I do a show that 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 was that did like well by my standards and then I do something else that is not good at like <laughs> you get that weird wave wave line effect. Totally, it's not as yeah. so. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's always but a hustle, but you're a hey, hustler. I love it. I'm a you, hustler. That's, that's how you and I met a few years ago. And that's I know right. now, Jeff, you, um, and congratulations are... to you on your man. You're just churning them out. You've done, you, oh, I think thanks. you've done two more shorts since yes, you did. Since, uh, uh, so yeah, I did family history. I did twin is now on the festival. Twins, market, uh, twins. Yes, circuit, yes. Twin. And mm -hmm. then, um, I just shot my own, which we'll talk about it in the next episode. My own okay. scream fan film, which, I'm excited. Yeah, to tell very you excited, excited to hear. You to... Congratulations Thank on that. You. Wonderful. Oh, God. Wonderful. You know, and, and you are a filmmaker as well. I know we had our films this year at the CB yes. Hollow Film Festival, which That's now, I, right. I didn't get a chance to see your film. Now tell us about your latest oh, short. Oh, David? Was, 
David. It's, Dave. It, dash yeah, it's id. on. Um, yeah, like it's Dave online? slash id, like like yeah. the ID, like the id. Yeah, that's the. Yes, that was kind of like the, the pun. I picked and the you're name in it. because I wanted to. Are you David? I I shot, wrote, starred, edited, did the sound. I did everything in that wow. thing. I made it during the pandemic. I wanted to make a short. And um, it's on YouTube. You can watch. I'll send it to oh, you good it after is. this, okay. so you can see right. it. Um, That's great. And yeah, I just I I had a lot of fun making it. And you know, I yes, I play multiple characters, and the only characters, <laughs> you know, sometimes when you don't have someone around to act, you just gotta jump in front of the camera and do it oh, yourself yeah. if you I have to. That. I love that. And um, yeah, I like I like Sleepy Hollow International Film Festival. Those yeah. guys are awesome. They're so really solid. great. And I was yeah. so excited to get into that festival because I know you already, I think you already had a film last year, two years ago. No, I, I volunteered. And I had you volunteered. volunteered. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, I even mentioned you when, when they accepted me. I was like, oh yeah, my friend Jeff. Oh, uh, nice. You guys. And they were like, oh nice. yeah, we know from us. So yeah, yeah <laughs> like that, that festival, I know it's pretty new. It was only what? It's this year very was new. Second They've or only third? done two. They skipped two. over uh COVID 20, 20. and yeah. they're like what are, they're like what are we gonna do like we have to um they're like what are we gonna do we're gonna we, we either have to uh uh we have to do something this year as opposed to nothing so they did this drive they did the drive-in thing and it was That's really right. awesome it was and did really your well film done. play at the drive-in it played because it was a local film shot in Westchester, I believe. It was yep. played on the big screen right after the thing love and right it. before Chopping Mall. So that was really cool, oh. man. You know, it oh was, my um, God, Jeff, I love that. It was like a, it was a, a part of a showcase that was uh, full of films that were shot in Sleepy Hollow or in Westchester yep. uh, to, to highlight the local things that were happening there. And it was just, Man, they, those guys, they, they really do pour their heart and soul into it. And I just see this thing. Sleepy Hollow is super down with this festival, too. I just hope it continues to that. grow and grow and grow. And I yeah. I, 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 I contact, I cold called them the first year mm -hmm. when they made their debut. And I was like, look, I just want to volunteer. Like, I don't have any films to submit or anything. I just, if you guys just need an extra set of hands, I just wanted to get involved yeah. on a local level. So that's what I did. And yeah. I'll tell you. That is the immense benefit of fessing is that you just, you know, it's not a, it's not so much about even having, I've gotten immense benefit from either participating or going or volunteering at festivals without necessarily having any work in said festival. It's been an immensely beneficial experience for networking and meeting yeah. people and experiences. And it's just very, very rewarding. Definitely. to do such things so oh yeah and to be with your your fellow film makers right and you're talking yeah you're talking that's why last night i was with four people who i had all met three people who i had all met at festivals and oh, nice. we, we talked for four and a half hours about movies because that's, awesome. that's what we that's what we do you know yeah, so that's your language yeah. oh i love that precisely that's great good mm -hmm. well good i'm glad your film's already on youtube well yeah send me the link and i'll have to I will. spread the word i need to do that with family history i just finally got it on prime but at, as you probably know prime now no congratulations longer. yeah thank you it's a whole process as you know to get it on prime but uh, now they yeah. no longer they closed shorts. the gates you got in yeah. you got in right yeah. before the gates closed however it's not streaming it's or, um it, you can you can pay to rent it or buy it but it's not part right. of prime streaming yeah you know that's so, frustrating do you know about that's film Hub? annoying do you know about film, film hub? hub um i don't know I, it sounds familiar. we're gonna talk about film hub. I'll, I'll, after the show i'll tell you all about film hub or i'll, I'll send you some, some information you should submit family history um mm -hmm. to film hub all you should put all your shorts it's basically a digital online marketplace for features and short films Ooh. to get you in all kinds of outlets and stuff you can get on plex Okay. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, because I Amazon, even like applied. Just, yeah, I submitted it to uh, Alter. You know how Alter's very much yeah. become like a. But, yeah, but that's that was a big a no one. Yeah. And, you know, so yeah, that that's this great. is. Uh, I'm telling. This is a great marketplace. This is a really great marketplace for for you know creators and stuff. I'll tell. I'll tell you more about that later. But yeah, oh, you awesome. should check it out. Good. Tip. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. For sure. Cool. Cool. Good. All right. Well, good. I'm glad you're keeping busy and always creating. And speaking of creating, now let's rewind, Jeff. Let's go back. Yes. To this month, December, but 30 years ago, December 11th, 1991, was when Hook, Steven Spielberg's Hook, was released wide in theaters across the country. Now, I think this is actually, I'm pretty sure this is my first Spielberg film talking on this podcast since I've started it. And it's an interesting Spielberg film. 
uh, to talk about and we'll get into right. it. But before we start getting into and breaking down this film and why we love it, how we feel about it, I'll quickly set the scene for you, Jeff, for everyone listening. Uh, the time period, December 1991, some fun pop culture things that were going on. Right. Music side, Michael Jackson and Boys to Men were fighting for the top music spot. We had <laughs> Black black and White from uh, Michael Jackson. That was the number one. Boys to Men was a close number two. On the movie side, before Hook came in and was number one for weeks, we had Cape Fear, which I love. Martin Ooh, Scorsese, that yes. was big. The yep. Addams Family, the first film was huge. Yep. And we had Star Trek VI. Now, I admit, I actually don't think I've seen any Star Trek movies. Have you, Jeff? You probably have. I've seen a couple of them. Okay. You know, I, the rule not of really, thumb. You know, my thing. I think. The rule, yeah, not really my thing either. I'm more of a Star Wars guy. But the rule of yeah. thumb is with with Star Trek is that if you watch the even ones, are always going to be like I've seen Wrath of Khan and stuff. I've seen okay. Star Trek Four. The even ones are always going to be better than the odd ones. So How one, funny. three, five. Yeah, one, three, five are considered kind of whack, and two. <laughs> Four and six are what's up. And then obviously generations is just the jam because wow. Picard, Shatner together. Right. You know, wow. So. Okay. What a, what an interest. <laughs> okay. That's a great insight. Okay. So then yeah. Star Trek six had just come out, you know, right before hook. So I guess that was a, a better one according to mm -hmm. Mr. From us here. So good. Mm -hmm. So we had those on top of the box office and now hook comes in before we get any more into it, Jeff, I'd love in your own words, tell us what is hook about? Um, hook is hook is super interesting, actually, because it's essentially it's essentially a sequel to Peter Pan. Yeah. And it's almost like, OK, if you read comic books and the like, it's not the last Batman story, but like, you know, the Dark Knight Returns, which is about an over the hill, 55 year old Bruce Wayne coming back and becoming Batman again. This is like the. This is this is the Steven Spielberg, Peter Pan version of that in that, you know, totally. you know, Peter Pan has to become Peter Pan again in order to save his kids from Captain Hook. And it's just uh, it's and yeah, and it's a sequel. You can kind of imagine that the original Disney version is the 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 film that this is a continuation of, I would imagine. Right. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it's Hook is quite possibly my favorite Spielberg film. One of them, if not wow. the, yeah. Cool, I have Jeff. Deep, oh, I'm so glad. Deep admiration. That. Okay. A deep, profound admiration and love for Hook. And it's not just wow. nostalgic, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay, then I'm yeah. definitely looking forward to hearing <laughs> your favorite favorite bits and pieces of, the, of this film. So sure. good, yes, exactly, you're right. And you know, I was obsessed as you were with this film when it came out. I remember the McDonald's toys, all the merchandise. This movie was oh, so yeah. cool. Oh, but yeah. it's funny, it's been a while since I had seen it. I just rewatched it for this show. I hadn't watched it in full in many, many years. When was the last I time you saw of, it? Oh gosh, Jeff, like, I mean, it's 30 years old. I probably yeah. haven't watched it in full in maybe at least 15 years. It had been a long wow. time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I kind of forgot that it was a sequel, even though of course it's a sequel, you know, of course right. Peter Pan's grown up, but I kind a of continuation. forgot how a continuation. it's a continuation for sure. I kind of forgot that, you know, Maggie Smith is Wendy and, right? and what a what a brilliant idea to continue the story. What happens when Peter Pan grows up, right. comes to the US and, you know, mm -hmm. from wherever Neverland is, you know, and lives his life and now is thrust back into this crazy world. And then the whole memory thing, not re really remembering. Well, here's to, what's interesting. You know, he's he has an American accent despite being raised in Britain. But but his wife played by Emma right. Thompson. Right. Is that Emma Thompson? Uh, Emma Thompson lookalike. I think her name is Caroline Goodall. She, okay. she is a, um, very much a lookalike of Emma Thompson. Totally. They are sisters for sure. Yeah. They're sisters from other misters. And yes. she she has she's kept her british accent so right for i don't know i guess we have to if we want to fill in a little bit of backstory he pro he travels to america goes to business school um does yeah. the best he can to ditch whatever british accent he might have been raised with and then comes back to visit wendy and falls in love with moira right and yes. that and that's why she has a british accent and he doesn't that's my only so that if 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 uh if peter panning wanted to 
if Robin Williams wanted to, in story, if he wanted to speak with an English accent, he would effortlessly do it. He just doesn't do it because he's one of those guys who's kind of like trying to like be this persona of yeah, yeah, right. So blending right in yeah. with his fellow, right. you know, business right. corporate people. Right, right, right. totally. Okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now I'm going to quickly introduce Jeff uh, to everyone. I'm going to introduce all the major players in this film. Director, writer, and our, of course, our major stars. Lots of Oscars in this group of people. It's very fascinating. So, of course, we'll, we'll start with the biggest person, Steven Spielberg, right? I thought it was yep. very interesting. I read, and maybe you did as well. This was in the works for a while. Spielberg wanted to make this film in the mid-80s. Ten years. Ten right? years, I think. Absolutely. Something like that. And he felt very much connected to the story. I guess he also mm -hmm. kind of had um, a little bit of Peter Pan qualities in him. He saw, you know, a connection there and really wanted to work with Disney on this in the 80s. But it was a lot of starting and stopping. And then the right. film moved to Paramount and TriStar and different things. But yep. so by the time the film finally came out in 1991, Spielberg already, of course, had multiple Oscars by this time. He already, yeah. you know, got the noms for Color Purple, E.T., everything. He had just produced Curly Sue, which I thought was funny. I didn't know he was involved in that. I did not know that either. Going back to Cape Fear, at least on IMDb, he is an uncredited producer of Cape Fear, which came out a month before this. Wow. And on the directing side, he had just directed a film I have not seen. I barely have heard about it. Always. I guess it wasn't one of his more huh. successful ones. Always okay. came out in 1990 with Richard Dreyfuss. So he had just, that was his last directing effort. And then before that, of course, was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade in 1989. Right. So that's right. where this comes in his in his uh, filmography. Now, on yep. the writing side, of course, like like Jeff said, this is a sequel continuation to the original Peter Pan story written by J.M. Barry. Now, the screenwriters, I thought this was very interesting. Screen story credit goes to James V. Hart, who also co-wrote the script. He hadn't really done much before this. He went on to do some big things. But how funny horror connection. Nick Castle. Did you see this, Jeff? Nick Castle, who we know as The Shape, as Michael Myers. Yeah, he actually the plays The Shape. He he was also yes. uh, a writer on uh, Escape from New York, maybe? He's yes, done a bunch. He, he's he's uh -huh. written a lot of stuff. He's written it's a lot so, of stuff. He's had such an interesting career, right? But yes, yes so but he, he is the original Michael Myers. Shape. He is the original shape. He's come back in the, you know, recent Halloween sequels, at least in right. like cameo bits. But right. yeah, so right. he had co-written Escape from New York. Love that movie. And had directed Love some it. films, The Last Starfighter. H how interesting. Right. He came up with the story. He's one of the people that came up with this story. And I did not know He was going to that. direct it. He was going to direct it. I saw when it was, when Spielberg had his first son, I believe, and stepped away from it and said, I'm going to do something else. Right. That's when Nick Castle came in because I guess he was starting to become a thing in the eighties, of course, on the directing side. And so this was his film. And not until Dustin Hoffman and Robin Williams came on and they started kind of clashing with Nick Castle and didn't agree on his vision. That's when Spielberg was brought back on. So very interesting to see Nick Castle's name in this family fantasy film that you wouldn't normally see, right? Thought that was pretty cool. And then yeah. um, a, another co-writer is another newer writer, Malia Scotch Marmo. I looked her up. She had only really done one other uh, script before this. And fun fact, Carrie Fisher was a ghostwriter on this film. She is not credited, but what? I know Car Carrie Fisher had done some ghostwriting, of course, in the 80s, 90s. She did mostly did that. ghostwriting for Tinkerbell's dialogue, which is kind of funny because now that you know Tink that, you you're mean like Tinker Hell. <laughs> Tinker Hell, I know, I know. And how interesting, the drama between Julia Roberts and Steven Spielberg. I didn't know yeah. at all. They really clashed and did not get along. And I guess I've never worked since. So yeah, Carrie Fisher, how funny, right? I love that. I love that little yeah. uh, movie trivia. Um, and then, so of course on the cast, we'll quickly talk about the actors. Dustin Hoffman as Hook. He had already won two Oscars by this time. He had just done Dick Tracy. Right. I like that movie, but such a wacky, interesting film. Yes. And he just won the award for Rain Man and was just an Ishtar, big, famous kind of flop in the late 80s. Moving over to Robin Williams, he had also uh, two, he had two Oscar noms by this time, hadn't won yet. 
He had just done The Fisher King, Awakenings, and Dead Poet Society. Classic film. Classic. Julia Roberts. How interesting. Julia Roberts as Tinkerbell, which we'll get into how we feel about her. Um, she went on to be nominated for a, a Razzie uh, for Worst Actress in this film, which I thought was funny. Um, really? She, yeah, isn't that interesting? She already, again, had two Oscar noms by this time, which is wild because when you think about it, this was 1991. She had already woman? been in pretty woman and uh steel magnolias she already had huh. Oscar noms for them but she had also just done sleeping with the enemy flatliners and mystic pizza was only in 1988 so in just like a very fast three years she's already in this yeah. major film with spielberg already you know it's just what a what a crazy and she has that e she has that d difficult ego that mm. early as well so right mm. exactly which is the clashing yeah which yeah that's kind of awkward yeah. it's like you know you've only been around for a bit and then wrapping up our cast bob hoskins who is so Ugh. committed to sme wow so great he is so great he has had already had one oscar by this time he had just done mermaids with Cher and winona Ryder. who framed roger and rabbit. of course who framed roger rabbit amazing movie right and then maggie smith who we were just talking about a few minutes ago she already had her two oscars by this time she had just done a yeah. room with a room with a view with james ivory which was a big thing in the late 80s so a lot of movie star very royalty right but between you know your maggie smiths and your julia roberts whether you were early in your career or late Later, a lot right. of Hollywood royalty in this film, you know, for sure, pretty crazy. So, Jeff, now that we have introduced all the major players, we know where everyone is in their career. Let's get to the movie. Why do you love Hook so much? What about it? Do you just just eat right up? Um, so it's a combination of it starts with the nostalgia. Obviously, yeah. it's a movie I grew up. I was uh, part of the Rufio generation of oh, Rufio. Like we all loved Rufio, and yeah. um, I don't know the name of the. He was the 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 heavy set uh, black kid. Yes. I forget his name. Who plays? What's his name in the in the? I forget um, his name as well. But man, I love that kid. He is so like right. lovely. You know what I mean? He's he's, just, he's awesome, and I'm gonna he. Look him up. He was, yeah, please look him up because I want to say his name properly and, and his character name. And he didn't really have much of a career after Hook, but he is iconic. Like people, oh. he's so iconic to this film as one of the Lost Boys. And oh, yeah. uh, his just, smile he, is like so yeah. memorable, right? He's just, he's just great. He's great all around, um, you know, and, and so like these, just like the whole, the, there's so many nostalgic sort of, like memories and pieces of hook and then combine that with you know sort of not watching hook in a while or sort of having it in my sort of peripheral and then right. uh revisiting it and loving it sometime in the in the aughts like really okay. loving it like having a huge impact and then um you know after robin williams died right in what was that 2014 is when mm -hmm. i watched it the day he died you know and it was oh, very wow. yeah it was like you know because that's the thing about robin williams is that like you know he's a part of our childhoods and we love mm -hmm. we he universally beloved actor and you know the the comfort of you know losing someone like that is that he's always going to be there in those movies and anytime you miss robin you can just sit down and watch one of his movies so i was watching we my wife and i we mourned his loss we mourned the loss of robin williams by watching yeah. hook and it was that screening that just really cemented that this I because I had never really had a favorite Spielberg film. It mm -hmm. was always just kind of like, you know, I loved so many Spielberg films. We all love Spielberg. I mean, Spielberg's right. like, you, you know, one. Yeah. how do you choose one? But when I have to like, if someone says, well, what's your personal, like if I have to say, what is his best film? Maybe Jaws. I mean, that is really, mm -hmm. oh, God. that's such a, it's very subjective. He's done so many different things, but I'd say Jaws is up there too. Jurassic Park. Oh my God. Jura yes. <laughs> I was going to say Jaws and Jurassic are like, Jesus and, and Christ. E oh, you know. he did ET. Like it just goes on. The it, list goes right? on and on. But like in it's terms crazy. of like personal, right. In terms of personal favorites, I'd also have to say probably right up there with Hook would also be Jurassic Park for mm -hmm. incredibly nostalgic reasons. But I'm re watching yeah. it and I'm like reveling in what this movie is really about thematically like mm -hmm. the and 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 getting verklempt in a way that i had never done before i i started uh i started to get very choked up the moment where he finally crows after mm -hmm. oh yeah he says when rufio goes you can fight 
you can fly. And then Robin Williams cuts him off and he crows and he holds up his his coconut sword in the air and they all crow. And what's so beautiful about it is it's a story about um, it's it's a it's like a twofold story. It's a story about um, losing touch with your roots and your identity of who you are. And it's also a story about like realizing who you really are. It's like twofold in that kind of way. And the the moment where he crows it, it's such a it's a moment of i don't even i can't even describe it it was it's almost like uh it, it's like euphoric it's a euphoric oh yeah epiphany of recognizing exactly what you are and being in touch with it and loving yourself and accepting yeah. who you are on that level and it's just it's just so triumphant and beautiful. It makes this film so beautiful. And people complain about the running time. And you know what? I just say F you. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like it's just it, it's it's telling its story and it doesn't right. care. It doesn't care about convention. It doesn't care how long it's taking. And it just does its thing. And it's not so much a film as is an epic because it, it's two and a half yeah. hours oh, long. Yeah. It's a oh, long yeah. it, movie. It is kind of long. The, you know, rewatching it this time. Some parts did dip for me. I do feel like yeah. even though even though Dustin Hoffman and Bob Hoskins are so committed and just chewing <laughs> the scenery, right? I do feel like some of their scenes, I'm like, all right, that can be a little shorter. Some of the pirate stuff actually for me, once we get to meet all them and see the pirate world, then later on, I'm like, all right, we can keep going. You know what I mean? Like anything with Robin and the Lost Boys. I mean, we'll talk more about them, but anything with our boys By the way. is just... I'm I'm glued to the screen. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Secret secret cameo trivia. Do you yeah. know who goes in the boo box? Yes, I do. Tell us, Jeff. It's Glenn Close. I love that. It's and, and so we, awesome. <laughs> now, I couldn't I couldn't find it in my in my brief googling these last few days. Now, do you know why she did that? Is there any backstory? Or? I no, I don't actually know why she was there, but it's just you know what was that what was that movie where it was uh, where Glenn Close was playing the butler? Oh my god, movie? yeah. Um Albert Knobs. <laughs> yeah, and it was like proto Albert Knobs. You're and it was so just so right. on it's just it was it was honestly it's such a great it's such a great cameo and it kind oh, of yeah. makes me I, I gotta be honest, it almost kind of like makes me wish that there was more of that sort of thing happening. Mm-hmm. Like I kind of want I, I I kind of like I feel like it adds such an interesting like dimension to characterization. Oh yeah. If you have like a woman playing a, a male like a man part, but like completely straight. Like not oh, yeah. like not like uh in a tongue in cheek, like we we secretly know that you are a woman. Like 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 in both Albert Knobs, I think, and in this, like you you are meant to believe that this is, you know, uh oh, yeah. that, that, that there is no drag or whatever you want to call it going on here. And right. I feel like we, I, I just kind of wish we had more of it because it's yeah. so, it just adds like such another dimension. Oh, totally. Uh, and, and especially and makes, with her, like again, fully oh my committing. God, she's so good. She's, she's so good. So good. And, the, and that scene freaked me out as a kid still with the scorpions <laughs> going in. Oh yeah. yeah. That was terrifying. But you I doubted forgot. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot that that was pretty early in the film. You know what I, I mean? Did. Like I did. Yeah. It's very exactly. early. Oh yeah. It she, sets up who Hook is. It sets up oh, who Hook I, is. Oh yeah. He, because we, you know, and, right, but it, it also like, but it sets up his vanity, which is a, a reoccurring theme sure. that he's which is very also funny. vain, right, yep. and which also fits in with the hook, the fact that he has a hook, and you know, uh, just like how he is, he's and he's such a peacock too, like he just so um, uh, over the top in 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 every sense of the word. But yeah. when he's saying all of, he's talking about his plans and how great he was. And he said, but somebody doubted me and he makes, mm-hmm. he knows he keeps track. Like, it's not like, you know, the, the phrase of a lion isn't concerned with the opinion of sheep. And it's like, we learn very quickly that hook is not a lion because he's oh, very yeah. much concerned with the opinion of, of a Glenn close sheep. And when, yeah. when Glenn close breaks, he gets right up uh, in the pirate's face and he goes, but you doubted me. And then <laughs> Glenn close goes, I did. Yeah, I did. I did. I like did. it's just so okay. The boo box and my son oh. loved the boo box. He thought it was yeah? great. Oh, yeah, my he God. thought it was awesome, man. 
<laughs> I, I would love actually to, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. I need to Google like YouTube. How did they do that? I'm sure she went into the box and then they shut it. And there must've been a little trap door for the scorpions to go in. Cause then a guy's right. putting this, you know what I, oh. It's a tight box. It looks like a tight always box. Always freaked me out. Yeah, yeah, it <laughs> always. And what a memorable scene. That's also what makes that cameo so special is that like like when I was just watching it again for the first time in years with my husband Greg, who actually yeah. either only watched it once long, long ago and forgot a lot of it, or oh, never wow. watched it, which is shocking. He was like, I'm like, Do you what know was that his is? reaction? Um, he unfortunately is like those haters that thought it yeah, was way did, too long. It was too way awful, too yeah. long. But but okay. um, you know, was was really loving a lot of it, but really just thought it dipped here and there too much, mm -hmm. you know, even okay. with like some tink stuff later on. Um, so, you know, I understand. But, I feel um, like your patience, patience comes like, again, nostalgia can create patience for mm -hmm. something that might for be unbalanced. Sure. Like for me, that movie doesn't have a slow beat in it because mm -hmm. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, I need that because that's just part of the movie and that's just what it is. And that's what I remember as a child. Yeah. I've always accepted this. But if you're coming at it from an adult, from an adult perspective and you didn't grow up with it, you, right. you're you are going to be more objective. Yeah. More critical. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So oh, I, yeah. I totally I get what Greg I totally understand Greg's perspective as well. You know, right. Totally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But. Well, I, I love that you brought that up because, yeah, what a great scene. Great little role for a major <laughs> actress. <laughs> And and so memorable for us kids freaking out about that. Wow, oh, that was a scene. Phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, you know some other moments that sort of well, let's talk about Tinkerbell real quick because right, some other moments this time when I was watching, you know Julia Roberts, it makes perfect sense to hire her in this iconic role, big star, very young. But um, sh what do you think of her performance and her role in this, Jeff? Does it all work for you? So it does. All right. So maybe I'm a little biased here because I don't know what it, it like. I, I'm in general. I'm not a Julia Roberts like fan yeah. really of her acting. And, you know, uh, she is, you know, um, she is lauded for her beauty mostly. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, she doesn't do it for me. She does mm -hmm. not really. I She just doesn't really do it for me. However, there is something she's got like this cute pixie thing going on yeah. in in uh hook and i don't know listen i don't know if like i don't want to sound like I, I know that sounds very superficial like as if that allows me to overlook or underlook a performance like based on right. her like actual looks however i i think that she i i never have had a problem with her performance as tinkerbell i always thought that okay. it just was you know again and that also probably comes from watching it young too like yeah. it's just so matter it's matter of fact dude like it's just oh, yeah. You know, like like yeah, that's Tinkerbell in this film, and she's just you know, uh, she's she's uh, Peter's confidant, and she's the one, she's keeper of the knowledge, man. Oh, she uh, is totally. the one. Like everything is kind of predicated on her. It was predicated on her, you know, even bringing him to Neverland in the first place. Mm -hmm. Oh, she definitely. Sort of was like a, a surrogate mother to him at one time, and then mm -hmm. kind of like. Freudian Lee becomes like a love interest for a yeah. split second, which is weird. That's that bit, that part that you just got to. That, yeah, I forgot about Freudian. that. Yeah, yeah well, rewatching, I was like, oh, she like is kissing Peter and like she loves it. She even says, like, I love you. Like, that, yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. I think maybe on she's paper, confused with her feelings. It works. Yeah, maybe. I, I like don't know. She's something... she's like she's she's got her. You know how sometimes I mean that 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 stuff kind of happens sometimes where you yeah. have a close relationship where maybe you're not necessarily biologically related, and then like you know you find feel an attraction for the other person or something. Maybe that's what that you know wires yeah, yeah. can get oh, yeah. crossed. I mm -hmm. from my understanding, so maybe that maybe the wires got crossed and she yeah. just didn't. And you're you know probably right. That's probably exactly yeah. what they were going for. But it just was a little weird for me to be like. It's a little uncomfortable. Her, it's a little of, weird. Like, I'd say for her, the first half of the film, great. I love when mm -hmm. she's, you know, in the apartment and, and when we're back in London and, right. he, you know, falling down the dollhouse stairs and, and you know, telling him to clap. Like, all that good stuff. It totally works. It's just later on when she gets a little dramatic. She's in the dress. She's really trying to, like, woo him. And then she's full grown. It takes a turn that I don't know if it really works. That's when it's like, whoa, she's like really trying to come on to Peter. She is downright sad when he chooses his family in the end over her. 
yikes you know like yeah it just, it's, it's an interesting um turn for tink but it, at the same point at the same time it it does make sense for her to really you know hold on to him because yeah like you're right she's his biggest ally for most of the movie she's she even says like oh you know like you can do it uh, you know you can fly and she's so his she, biggest hold promoter on. is she grooming him oh oh my gosh wow i'm the uh, look i don't want to take it there and you, i just told you how i just told you how much i love this movie yeah but like you you just brought or... up something super interesting that <laughs> yeah. she's championing him and then all of a sudden she's like she's kind of like putting it all yeah. out there she yes. it, maybe she is may, uh, wow Jeff. <laughs> maybe she, she is uh kind of grooming him a little bit oh or at least gosh. in modern listen as we understand yeah. things in today's world in 1991 right. you were to say that and you'd be and someone would just be like oh, yeah, yeah. What, what's wrong with you man like oh, don't yeah, go yeah. there but We'd in today's awful. world yeah, yeah we're, we we we've learned so much about these mechanics is these these um these sad tragic social mechanics that occur exactly. in real life yeah. and how that maybe you, you when you retroactively look at something you could kind of see where it could go there so maybe there is a little bit of uh i don't i really don't want to say that, that though because so i love yeah because I, lo I love this movie so much and i don't oh, want to yeah. like it's uh, just you know criticize a, little, that uh, way, but... a little side thought like maybe she is yeah she really it's wants a, him it's to fly a and to be peter and then she wants to kiss yeah. peter hmm, and then she know? wants to kiss peter it, it's well if you have to remember she's kind of like an immortal being like she's been right. she was she was she's lonely. fully grown up yeah but she's exactly that too and all the fa fairies are dead because people stop believing them but right, she right. is but but what's interesting is she is i mean she's fully adult when she discovers peter as a baby so here's the thing here's the hot take ready hmm. by bringing peter to neverland and teaching him how to fly she is trying to make him into a fairy just like her she's yeah. trying to imbue him with magic that will because peter is actually you know 70 something years old by by human year standards and he spends a lot of time in neverland where he doesn't age right. so he's so much like so while he's not a fairy per se he has fairy like qua uh, qualities mm -hmm. very like um uh things that are instilled in him by this version of tinkerbell in this world and uh and then another interesting layer to the onion oh and and not not connected in any way but just i would say for a sheer sense of irony yeah. of it all is that michael jackson was involved was tied and involved in this film uh, before yeah, robin williams he was very going to play peter pan because he has an affinity for peter pan right. so it's very Never interesting how match. Right. So it's like it's super interesting how mm -hmm. how we just thought of that just now and how like I don't know. It's just super weird. Yeah. Super you're, weird. You're so right. That is a really weird connection. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, not, so... yeah, I'm not saying that there's anything to no. it or anything, but it's just it's interesting just... to notice that the all those parallels and stuff. That's all. Yes. That's what I mean by that. So, totally. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Weird, weird, weird. Okay. Well yeah. we'll 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 go back to some lighter stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Um <laughs> But real quick before I throw it over to you, I also wanted to say, you know, something that I re that really stuck with me in this film. There's many, many things. The mermaids. Yeah. I don't know why, but I love the mermaids. Oh, they're I great. love that love scene. The I love how it's so dreamlike and quiet. And mm -hmm. I think I also loved, even as a kid, I could tell like that's not CGI. That's not an animation. Those oh, are under the water. Underwater yeah. with bubbles. I mean, it that yep. was very effective for me. But the beginning, before we even get to Neverland, I was actually quite scared. And I still get a little scared as an adult with the, you know, the hook latch opening up. Oh, you know? yeah. Um, you know, the, and we don't see Hook at all in, in London. You know, we don't see him until Neverland. But this sort of ghost like you know thing that opens up the the doors and makes this apartment very creepy you know uh, that and even and then how we're we're cutting back and forth between home where the kids are with toodles and uh liza toodles kind of freaked me out too he was a little um you know when he's like he, lost he, he really marbles. did he really did lose his marbles but then yeah. how we're cutting back and forth to the event that's you know uh honoring wendy granny wendy and all that and right how she can feel something's wrong like that that is all very effective for me i like how we're getting a little dark we're getting a little spooky yeah. you know hook is actually someone to fear you know then of course once we really meet him there's no fear at all 
But I loved all that opening stuff and how how Robin Williams is even kind of a little freak to be in that bedroom, you know, and looking at the oh yeah the painting on the wall and everything. I love all that suppressed suppressed PTSD from his times as a child yeah. fighting an adult pirate man who's trying to kill him. You know, yeah, maybe absolutely. on some level. Yeah. Um, the so then the other thing that Hook does is it it or at least it tries to, and it's never it's never really expressed like fully expressed or it doesn't like really commit to this angle i should say this idea that oh it was all made up it was all a dream or what's real is this is this real like doing the guillermo del toro pan's labyrinth mm. sort of trip of like is this uh imaginary is it real uh what happened what what doesn't because bob hoskins comes back at the end and he's in the real world and it's like oh did you just did i just make you up as as me and you're not really that me or maybe it was me maybe me escaped right. and found a job you know he took yeah. all that money and like kind of found a job like you know trying to you know like a hide undercover maintenance man yeah, yeah uh -huh. i don't know <laughs> yeah. he took his yeah. jewels and he ran he took off he took took off with the jewels but then we see toodles at the end float away and we're right. it's like no 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 this really did all happen but like the, yeah true. the hook on the door the, the the hook the hook latch on the door the the window it's all of it is supposed to you know what it is it's almost like spielberg is saying i want to give you enough uh i want to give you enough room to possibly deny that this is real yeah so that you can judge for yourself like i don't want you to straight mm -hmm. up think that this is real or at least until we go to neverland i don't want you to think this is real i don't know right. there's some yeah. i think you're on something there it's, it's yeah. very like wizard of oz you know where where she wakes right, up right, and like right. you were there you were there it's same sort of thing he's putting these same things in where thing. it's like is this real you know and because even granny wendy it's like are you just an old kind of crazy lady or are right. you really the Wendy? You know, we're, he's right. putting some doubt in there, which I think also adds a little bit to this darkness. Like, what's going on here? You know, absolutely. Yep. But um, yep. you actually bring up something I even wrote in my notes. The end, when Toodles flies off, it's a fun, you know, great fantasy moment. But I just thought it was funny. The kids and Robin and, and Maggie Smith and Wendy, of course, would all, you know, believe that. And they're laughing and it's a hopeful moment. But I feel like Moira... Peter's wife would be freaking the fuck out. I feel like she'd be like, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Like she doesn't know any of this is right. actually real. She never went to Neverland. So I She's just thought it was funny accepting. how they're, they're all right there on that little balcony and they're laughing and they're all, you know, and I'm like, I, what did I write? I wrote something like, okay, there's Toodles flying and no one is freaked out. Like, you know, I just feel like a movie today, maybe a little bit more cynical. You know, do we see a like, shot? Do we see a shot that cuts back to her like smiling or we, them all smiling? I'm pretty smiling? sure we do, and they're all in a row. Okay. And and yeah, then that's ridiculous. Famous line, yeah, you know, to live would be an awfully great adventure, and they're all just like, ah. And I'm like, Moira would Moira first of all is freaking out that her children are gone, and then suddenly they're gone. They're suddenly they're back, and now this old man that she knows is. Fine. I'm just like Moira would be like. Okay, like I just imagine if this was Catherine O'Hara in Home Alone or something. She'd yeah, oh, like, she would just be like, ah! yeah, you've got some splaining to do. Like, what the hell? Yes. You know? Yeah, exactly. You're right, man. You're so right. And, you know, um, she's just, she's very, she is very, accepted. And, and maybe, maybe, I mean, she did grow up with this mythology that, like, there is that, I mean, the mythology was present even before Pete, when Peter Panning, Banning, whatever, yeah. when, when, before they, before the adventure takes place, like there, we are firmly rooted in, in Peter Pan lore. I mean, they're seeing a school play of Peter yeah. Pan. Very meta. You know? Huh. Yeah, totally. It's meta, but it's also kind of like, it's also kind of like, oh yeah, Peter Pan is just a story in this right. world. Mm-hmm. And so maybe, and it's a story that maybe that they grew up with ex, like an extra amount because she's been so steeped in, they've been steeped in that mythology because of, I mean, mind you, Toodles has been looking for his marbles for a very long time. So it's possible yes. that Myra, Moira, Myra is always, was always like, just like, oh yeah, that there's Toodles in the corner looking for his marbles again. Like, right. so maybe, it's... maybe she's more, I mean, I'm trying to give this, I'm really trying to give the benefit <laughs> of the doubt here, but yeah. it's, it's very hard. It's not yeah, easy. No, I hear you for <laughs> sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I yeah. love how it starts with the play and you're so right. And, and Wendy talks a lot about the book. J.M. Barry was the neighbor. So like, yeah, the whole lore of Peter Pan is just such a part of 
not only this family's lives, like, oh yeah, that's when that's Granny Wendy's thing. Right. But just the whole country, the whole world. It's like, oh yeah, Peter Pan, the kids, of course, are being, you know, they're performing Peter Pan. What else is new? You know, uh, which right. just makes it that much more exciting for us when we realize and he realizes that he is the Peter Pan. You know, it's really such a cool twist and a very clever, interesting, like layered twist. I feel like the, the script had to be a little hard to get right, you know, getting all these different which things. Which is why, exactly, which is why it, it and if anything, it fe it doesn't feel as dated as it might feel. If it was called Peter Pan, we would just kind of be like, it would just kind of be like, like remember when Robin Hood came out in 1991 or whatever with Kevin Costner? Mm -hmm. And there have been mm -hmm. several versions of Robin Hood. Yeah. And if you were to maybe call it, not call it Robin Hood, maybe if you had called it the Prince of Thieves, or mm -hmm. maybe if you had called it something else like Sherwood or something that it would stand out from just mm. being, Oh, that's Robin hood 91 versus Robin hood 74 versus right. Robin hood, you know, like, and so to call it hook, to not call it Peter Pan and to just sort of make it this thing. That's like, it's so much bigger than yeah. Peter Pan. It's like they, it's like Peter Pan was like this, thing you can't see what yeah. i'm doing in podcast form but i'm enclosing my hands like a small circle and yeah. then i'm sort of saying that like outside of that small circle encompassing all of peter pan is the movie hook it's taking right. us inside the world of peter pan it, we're outside of the world of peter pan it's just it's all friggin encompassing and it's interesting that it's called you know even though the film the, the film's protagonist is robin williams right the movie is named after the antagonist who is so i mean this is one of the most delicious like mm. villain roles in the history of villandom it's so it's so freaking good i i, I try yeah. there's nobody else who could probably do justice except maybe tim curry i think tim oh, curry yeah. that's funny because my husband said wasn't hook played by tim curry i'm like not in this movie that's so funny yeah you because you know what there is because you know what it is and i'm and this is here's another hot take for you mm. i don't think dustin hoffman meant for this and i don't think he was probably even aware of the role but there's absolutely there is he is channeling a little bit of frankenfooter there's a little bit oh totally of fucking yeah. dr frankenfooter oh, in yeah captain james t hook and if you For look sure. at it through you can you feel the tim curryness yeah. of the role it was like, like built for someone like tim curry if it right. wasn't dustin hoffman playing hook yeah and so oh, totally mm -hmm. yeah so it's like you know he's got a lot of charisma he's he's charming he's magnetic he chews the scenery to no end mm -hmm. he's the type of villain that like you don't like you have to you do gymnastics in your head to be like well he's not really a villain he's like you know just kind of like he wants to get his revenge but like you just kind of he's more of like uh i don't know he's more he's just more of like uh a, a diva he's like uh oh, you know totally. he's just like this yeah. he's just like um a larger than life personality with a giant ego who who wants to you know for him it's his, his opponent Right. And he even oh, talks yeah. about form, good form, bad mm -hmm. form. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And he's his, very his aware type... of himself and what how he should be, how you should be, good form. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And and you know, his revenge, it's not like he's out to necessarily like murderate people. Like, for instance, like instead of like instead of like slitting his crew his uh, you know, the pirate's throat, he puts him in a box, he puts Glen Glen Coast in a box with a bunch of scorpions and right. tosses it over the side of the, the thing, or I don't even think it gets tossed over the side. It just puts, puts scorpions in a box. Yeah. Or, he like closes her out of sight. You know, yeah. he doesn't actually want to see anything bad. And, and I think the worst that happens is sometimes some pirates kind of accidentally get shot, but yeah, it's never oh, like he, a no, violent. He, oh yeah. He's shot. He does shoot one pirate, you know, he shoots right. a pirate that's stealing a base. Yeah. And but what's interesting is, yeah, it's not, it's like, he's not like a violent villain. He's like a dastardly villain who, mm -hmm. whose revenge is like, I'm going to make Peter Pan's kids love me, yeah. which is so much more interesting. Which Like, it's yeah, so it's... much better villainy than oh, totally. saying, like, I'm going to kill you. Like, well, oh, yeah, he literally brainwashes uh, the son, Jack, which is yeah really twisted when you think about it you're like yeah. oh wow yeah he he's a good villain he's not just talk about groom <laughs> talk about oh grooming. yeah talk about grooming not oh non-sexual yeah. grooming non-sexual <laughs> yeah, no, grooming no. but gro no. but grooming you know like yeah oh for it's just sure interesting. it's just interesting how like you know uh he's just he's just way more and that's why 
again, much like, you know, I think Gangs of New York falls in the mm. same sort of, are, are you, have you seen Gangs of New York? Yeah, I, I saw a long time ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, you should really rewatch it now that you've revisited Hook, because I think that William Cunning, played by DDL, Daniel Day-Lewis, yeah. he is very much a Captain Hook sort of oh, totally. antagonist. He is, you know, um, he is a fascinating, fascinating villain. And I have rewatched Gangs of New York all, you know, three hours or however the hell long right, it is. Right. Like, I don't care about Leo. I don't. Mm. I really don't. I watch it mm -hmm. all for Daniel Day Lewis because he's so uh, charismatic. And he's like, you're so confused because you know you're supposed to hate this guy, but you like him for oh, some yeah. reason. Or you he's like, you magnetic. appreciate. Yeah, he's a magnetic villain. And it's like, you're like, no, that's the bad guy. Remember that that's wow. the bad guy. But it's like the way he talks to you. And, you know, again, the best villains, and I think Hook falls in line. I'm sure, I don't know if you agree with this, Mark, but the mm. best villains are the ones that don't know that they're the bad guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, you know? it definitely at least makes for a very interesting villain where you really can see their point of view. You can see what they want. Right. They're actually not all that bad. But then, you know, things are twisted. Look at Thanos. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like Thanos is literally trying to commit genocide. Mm -hmm. And yet he's so there's something about Thanos that's so I, I don't know, like not charming per se, but like and, and you know what? The reason why that movie works so well is that you know the the protagonist is the antagonist thanos is the mm. is the is the main character of infinity war right and yet he's the antagonist of the film and that's why that film just works so well and so it's like the only person who gets to achieve their goal in the film is the one that's trying to do the the antagonistic thing yeah and uh it just works really well because thanos thinks that what he's doing is the right thing he doesn't think he is the bad guy which is why again yeah. you got guys like hook and guys like william cutting bill the butcher they these these villains work so well they're just so good and yeah. they they, oh, yeah. they create rewatch value so even if you don't like hook for its long running time or you think that it's padded down you know, there's so much hook and there's so much Captain James hook in there that you can just you can almost push it aside and go. This is great. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Oh, yeah. And um, I was just looking at my notes. A couple other movies that this movie reminded me of going back real quick to the beginning and how it was kind of creepy. Um, I believe Steven Spielberg was sort of like an uncredited director on Poltergeist. I know that was Toby yes. Cooper, but right. He yes. definitely, and you know, some of the shots in the apartment, especially once they come home from the event and you know, the, there, there's been a slash on the wall and the angles, it feels a little poltergeisty mm -hmm. later on when there's the big battle with the lost boys versus the pirates and we're on the ship and it's so much fun. It made me think a lot of another film that Steven Spielberg was involved with the Goonies. You know, oh, yeah. definitely got oh, yeah. a lot of Goonies energy in the site. It's you know? that Spielberg, you know, the, in the same way that a great example of what you're talking about, you're talking about like the, it's sort of like this, uh, it's the Amblin Spielberg mm -hmm. brand of adventure totally. yep. that permeates to other directors. And yep. it's the same thing with Zumeckis and Back to the Future and the Frighteners. So Peter oh, Jackson, totally. yeah. right? Peter Jackson directed the Frighteners, but it was produced by Zumeckis and it mm -hmm. feels it stars Michael J. Fox, no less. Right. And when you watch The Frighteners, you get that that Zumeckis -y, um oh action adventure that, vibe. Right. Yeah. Yes. Next time, uh -huh. rewatch The Frighteners. I, I just love did the Frighteners. for a podcast. Oh, it's a phenomenal yeah. film. It's we such just a did wacky, a podcast on on the uh, on the Frighteners for that other podcast that I was doing. Yeah. It's all movies in 1996. Oh, so my it's God. called the Real '96 Podcast. And so we did we did the fright the same group. We did that did Jingle All the Way last night. Also did the Frighteners. Oh my God, was and Jingle that was, All the Way in '96? Wow. Yeah, oh all God. of those movies were '96, and so yeah. like we did, we did Dunstan checks in. We did Big oh Bully. Remember yep. Big Bully with Tom oh, Arnold yeah. and Rick Moranis. Uh, Rick we Moranis. did. Um, yeah, we did. Which, by the way, gets really dark and absolutely yeah, could be a horror film. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's so funny. Wow. Yeah, but so I saw I saw those connections, and then of course with the score beautiful John Williams score yeah, great totally score. brings you right back to home alone. I mean, I feel like there were yes. moments from home alone that were just lifted. Lots of flourishes movie. with yeah, the kids, you know, the kid aspects, the absolutely. playfulness, the yeah. score is playful. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, the, 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 uh, there are all these kids' activities, like they have a skate park, and they're, you know, windsurfing, roller, they're windsurf skateboarding yeah. On, yeah. on a roller coaster track that they made out of bamboo. Uh, and, you know. What an that, amazing movie to be in as a kid. Can you imagine, Jeff? Oh, my Jeff, God. If we were in this movie running so around fun. in yep. these little, you know, in their little cute, like, uh, leaves where they sleep in this tree. Right, their I huts, mean, those little tree huts. Those little yeah, huts, great. like, it's oh, great. my God, Jeff. Like, can, can it get... I I don't think it what about I don't the know feast what about better. the feast the with like feast. all the all those weird like yeah. like I was frostings. Gonna say that as one of my like last i'll mention my one of my last favorite scenes that feast and how it takes us and peter a while to even realize what's going on it's all invisible they're just sort of doing a big acting exercise of eating improv right. food right and then right. once he believes and then how they're stunned he's stunned the audience is stunned to see all this beautiful crazy delicious colored. looking food yeah and how they all say you're doing it peter you're i doing it peter you're doing it, is, it right it is just truly i'm getting chills it is truly a beautiful and the scene dissing, and then the, the, diss oh, the dissing. dissing oh my the, God, it's so good and fun. the way he's like you are an irresponsible young man and then he's <laughs> yeah. like you're a rude dude crude full of dude right. food, food. yes oh my god i love that <laughs> and how and that how whenever he like says a dig that isn't so good they all do the plain whistle dude. like <laughs> it's just and i'll tell you something hot take about the food ready yeah. here's my hot take so it's like we see going back again to the the colorful plates of what seemingly look like frosting it's right. like blue and like wonderful wonderful production design oh and yeah meant to you know probably i bet you like the scripted word is like uh, a bountiful feast full of wondrous food to them what does that mean and like we're gonna just do these souffles of blue and green and red right here's here's my hot take that's frosting in their imaginary minds because what do kids love kids love frosting you, you lift the frosting up off a cupcake so you know those kids who are playing this imaginary game now as lost boys what do they remember when they were at the orphanage or their broken home or whatever they remember that one time of the year on their birthday when they got the cupcake and what did they eat yeah. off the cupcake they ate the frosting that was the best part oh, so yeah. now we're in in a place of imagination where the sky is the limit we're gonna have we have entire pies wow. just made out of frosting like yeah, like that's that a really great thought you're right you know the it's big very... rock the big rock candy mountain mm -mm. What's all right that? You... what's that okay okay in oh brother where art thou oh there... okay and there's the on the soundtrack it's a great i'll send you to you it's great in okay. the big rock candy mountain yeah uh-huh uh-huh the the jails are made of tin basically what it is it's a story it's like a story song from the dust bowl times and it's like right. really that old but basically it's talking about like what a, a hobo's ideal life is and like the like <laughs> yeah. like the easy life like 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 um like like hens that lay soft boiled eggs like like no work and the jails all are all made of tin meaning that you can escape you from can them just, yeah and yeah. gin flows from rocks it's like this imaginary hobo playground in the song that makes like you know the hard that allows a hobo to escape from their hard hobo life and imagine life on easy street is that the cops all have wooden legs so what's interesting is what's interesting about the song is it's not so much like you know the solution to the hobo's problem would be to just get a lot of money and live like the rest of the elite rich people no for like the hobo like what is a hobo's heaven in the same way of like what's a dog's heaven oh there's right. there's no mailmen and there are <laughs> there are bones on every there's bones and fire right. hydrants everywhere so this is like this is kind of like um easy street but it's like you never you don't stop being a hobo mm. so it's just like the hobo's life but at like the easiest level setting i feel like i didn't say that very well this whole no thing, no but, like, i get it yeah i don't it's... know if you're picking up what i'm putting down oh like, to absolutely it's it's the dream it's like the the dream come true right but that. from it's the yeah but from a whole but like they can't they don't have loftier expectations right. of like right. oh i could be like i could have like you know a house with like a job and a mortgage and absolutely like not be yeah. a hobo it's like no i'm still a hobo but the oh, hobo yeah. life is this easy where the cops all have wooden legs meaning that i'm still running from the police but it's just my hobo life isn't so hard it's easy oh, totally oh totally and that's what yeah. that frosting is on the dining room table it's the for... best day that they have experienced in their limited right. experience yeah 
Mm -hmm. Right, and then cranked up to eleven. Like we oh, ha yeah. we don't just have cupcakes. Like who cares about the cupcake, the cake part of the cupcake? We're just gonna have a a, a plate full of cup with no yeah. cake. Oh yeah, you know, oh, my God. just yeah. So 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 I I that's like because uh, I always like I always like sort of gravitated towards that aspect of the production design when I've when I've revisited this movie from time to time, and yeah. it's just God, what a wonderful film. What a, and yeah, that whole sequence. And I think that's the same sequence where, of course, they're doing the food fight. And then I think Rufio throws a coconut at Peter. A coconut, and yes. And that's the big moment where he, I yep. think someone throws him the, the sword and he's able to grab yep. it and does his cool. He goes, Peter, spin, and he does a shing. And then he slashes that coconut right in half and everyone yep. is stunned. And it's like, oh, wow. Like at this point, right. you are. 99% Peter like you're almost there you are there well you know? we finally see what's interesting is the 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 events are first he's able to use his imagination when he's able to use his imagination he's able to eat when he's able yeah. to like do that then when Rufio and he's able to to like dis Rufio right then it like unlocks a piece of Peter and then suddenly Peter starts to have belief and faith in himself yeah. and that's when he's like okay now I gotta fly like before yes. he was kind of not taking it he was approaching it from like an as like an adult and now he's like starting to think about it like as a kid and then once he figures out how to fly and thinks of like his mother and like the the memories that the, the happy right. thoughts that allow him to fly being a being a father it really gets right him, it allows yeah. him right and you know it's interesting that you said that it's interesting that you said that because it's becoming a father that allows him to unlock the memory of his mother mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah, so it's yeah, like yeah. the it's like he be, he thinks about what it was like to be a father and then that allows him to think of his mother and then when that happens he is able to fully come in contact with who he is on the inside of his person and like i'm even like getting a little emotional just thinking about it right now like yeah. it's just such a because isn't that what we all strive for in life like to come in contact and uh accept who we really are on the inside and like what we are and just like uh you know like you know the more important it's important to be validated from the outside but to validate ourselves from the inside is that's the like like the spiritual awakening the emotional epiphany of like you know i can crow and yeah. crowing he puts his arm on his hip and he just closes his eyes and crows so brilliantly and so like it's such like a pure um uh it's a pure unfiltered emotion with no there's no hang-ups there there's yeah. nothing that's holding him back from just com being completely lost in who and what he truly is and that at its core that's the moment for me that made me realize when I like revisited it like so many years ago that I was like, not only is this like a nostalgic favorite, but like this film is like seriously deep and beautiful. And oh, yeah, that's why I wow. love it. Oh, so, I love that, Jeff. Beautiful. Beautiful yeah. said. Yeah. yeah. Love, love, love. That's awesome. Cool. OK, well, it's already 315. So let's yeah. start to um, end uh, hook so that we get into Scream. But before we move on, I'll just. um wrap up hook i'll give you some post-released info so i thought uh, uh, excuse me for one minute i'm right yeah. here i'm just off yeah. screen go ahead oh I'm you listening. got it okay cool um so i thought it was interesting the film ran 40 days over its 76 day schedule so this movie took like 116 days total to shoot which is just wild amazing the long, budget that this long, movie had. long shooting time can you imagine i couldn't i can't even imagine i get tired after shooting a two-day short oh my god forget <laughs> it Forget it. Um, and on a sad fun fact note, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg has admitted in multiple interviews over the years, last few years, that he really is not proud of this film. He Boo! was disappointed with the final result. Jeff is booing. Jeff is not a fan of that kind of mentality. This film is perfect in Jeff's eyes. But Spielberg right. said, you know, and it's interesting, even though Spielberg was obviously developing this film, like we were saying, for 10 years, he was working on it in the 80s. And, you know, is he going to do it? Is he not? So then when he finally was directing, he is quoted saying, I felt like a fish out of water making hook. I didn't have confidence in the script. I had confidence in the first act and I had confidence in the epilogue. So basically, makes not, sense. not the Neverland stuff like he and, and he even said, whenever I felt insecure, I just had people make bigger and more elaborate sets. So it's very interesting that the, the core body of the film, he really felt insecure about. He said he just didn't have confidence in the body of the story. I mean, 
I still, you know, like we're saying, a lot of it absolutely works. So it's a bummer that he uh, really doesn't love this. But, you know, I think maybe it just was a lot of behind the scenes switching of hands. You know how that happens. You know, it was Nick Castle's and it was Spielberg's and then it's this company. You know what? So, you know, yeah. You know what? I think, and mind you, this is what he said after the film came out. And I'm sure everything you just said is totally true and valid. But I think you could. I, I think he poured a lot of his heart and soul into it, despite the battle, the uphill mm-hmm. battle that he was fighting. And I think when it was received the way it was received, because it was, you know, it's it's lambast, and a lot of people don't. Uh, a lot of people over the years are kind of like it's generally considered not to be a good movie or to right. be a flop. And I feel like Steven Spielberg is he, what he's doing. What he's doing, and it's like kind of tragic. Like I hate that. Something that I really hate, and this is like a whole other conversation that I, we don't have to discuss now because it's so long and it's a deviation. <laughs> but I just want to say I hate that Joel Schumacher apologized for Batman and Robin. Like it oh, really wow. did he? I didn't know that. Yes, I he did. Batman he publicly. Robin. So do I. Very it's much. Batman. I, um. Uh. What's the last one? Uh, Batman no, no, six oh, no. and six. Oh no, Batman and Robin. Okay, I don't love. I I was getting. That's the I one love, that's hated. Do you like Batman? I love Batman, Batman forever. forever. I do right. love that one. Batman and Robin, which he I made no as well. With. Yeah, because I know he made those two. Okay, I see. So he apologized for Batman and Robin. He, he oh. apologized because people really blamed blamed him greatly. And he just kind of shrugged his mm. shoulders and went mea culpa and admitted that, you know, obviously there were problems within the production. But, like, he essentially, like, had – he. it's like – the consensus is that Batman and Robin is not a good film. However, if you sit down and watch the first 15 minutes of Batman and Robin, it's fucking action packed on the edge oh, yeah, of your seat, freaking awesomeness. Oh yeah. But but what saddens me, and I feel like that's what that the reason why I brought up Schumacher is because I feel like that's what that's what Spielberg's doing here. He's essentially admitting mm-hmm. like defeat over something because it's almost either expected or that like it's his way of sort of sheepishly apologizing for something that he frankly does not need to apologize for. Right. Like these guys don't need to apologize for these films, even with their problems. They they have merit and stand on their own. You know, yeah. although I'm oh, sure yeah. people are judging my my opinion, my my uh, my taste by the fact that I like <laughs> Batman and Robin, but you know that's whatever. whatever. That's a whole whole other whole other ball of wax. I I think Hook is. I think Hook is uh, uh, an unadulterated masterpiece, and I think that Spielberg has nothing to apologize for. Love it. There you go. What a great way to end this episode. Absolutely. Hey, I mean, there's a reason why so many people, especially of our age group in their 30s, just think nothing but amazing positive thoughts about this movie. I mean, like I'm saying, you know, yeah, it, it it dips a little bit here and there for me, but there's a reason I chose this movie for this episode. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's an amazing movie. It brings me such joy. So uh, just wrapping it up, it ended up winning, or it ended up uh, earning five Oscar nominations. There you go. It did not win any, but I mean, art direction, uh, costume, visual effects, makeup, and original song. So obviously, you know, there was some major skill going on here. And of course, Dustin Hoffman was nominated for a Golden Globe for his role. And fun fact, he lost that Golden Globe to Robin oh. Williams for oh. The Fisher King for a different oh. So how <laughs> funny, you know, so at least one of them won. So there you go. Um, and, you know, the movie ended up making a ton of money. It is interesting in stupid corporate box office terms. It was still sort of a disappointment, even though it made $300 million worldwide. Uh, 119 of that was in the US and Canada. So 300 million worldwide, that was the fourth highest grossing worldwide film in 1991. It was number wow. one for multiple weeks, but you know, still it wasn't as best, as, as good as it could be. So right. whatever, we love it. It's exciting. It's a good time. And, uh, you know, that's hook for you. So, Jeff, you'll be back next week to talk about oh, yeah. Scream. Ooh, ah! Scream. There you go. Okay, go ahead.